On this weekend at Rice Tech, we take you through adoption and deployment of 5G technology and how the red tape is being cut for it. Plus, we have a fantastic guest drop by, David Ting, VP of Engineering of Datavisor, to go over unsupervised machine learning and fraud detection. Quiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyth, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 283, recorded March 23rd, 2018, Unsupervised Machine Learning. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so that you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started today at rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. Welcome to Twyat, this weekend enterprise tech, the show that is dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I am your host for today, Louis Maresca. I am your guide through the world of enterprise, but I can't guide you by myself. I definitely want to bring in my friends to help me guide you, and starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Jibbert, how's the geek in paradise today? Oh, the geek in paradise is desperately trying to learn relearn Extron programming so I can finish up the automation on a new video wall I'm building. Fantastic. What language are you guys doing that in? It's it's a drag and drop. It's just got lots and lots and lots of little widgets to turn on and tweak and so forth. So it's like filling out a ginormous spreadsheet. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, Mr. Curtis Franklin, you have new digs there, sir. How, how are things rolling out? Well, sitting here in the temporary digs down uh, in the Orlando orbit, still on the search for the permanent studio from this end of the world. Uh, and given that uh, we're still searching for a place to land, uh, things going pretty well. Enjoying finding all sorts of stuff to scare people over at darkreading.com. Fantastic. We're going to try to scare you today, too, on the show. So, But we do have a fantastic show. We're talking a little bit about 5G adoption and its deployment. And, that's, of course, we have a special treat, a great guest, David Ting from David uh, Datavisor, uh, to talk fraudulent uh, detection as well as AI. But first, like we always do, let's jump into the blips. So we're, we are no strangers to attacks and malware being embedded in images. We've seen malware within GIFs over the years. Well, PNGs are also not safe. This past week, Sonic Wall Capture Lab's threat research team has received reports that malware claiming to be an image file will actually drop crypto miner down on your Linux box. File itself will render as a normal image file, and file header is also pretty standard image file format. As the file is inspected more near the end of the PNG file format, there's actually a standard file format for an executable or ELF. By extracting the file from the image, it turned out that the uh, XM rig mon mono Monero cryptocurrency miner, where its main function is to mine Monero for from crypto pool. The interesting thing about this report is that the type of attack is so prevalent, there has been a trending increase in this type of attack via the gateway antivirus signatures over the past 40 days. What can you do? Well, make sure your gateway is up to date to ensure it's caught before your machines have to start making money. Well, this time, blame the Iranians. Well, nine of them, at least, because they've just been busted for hacking. The U.S. Department of Justice announced indictments of nine Iranian nationals for stealing more than 31 terabytes of data from more than 140 universities, 30 companies, and five government agencies in the U.S., as well as from victims in 21 other countries. This is one of the largest nation-state-sponsored cyber attack campaigns ever prosecuted by the agency. And that state-sponsored piece is important. According to the indictment, the alleged hackers working on behalf of the Iranian government's Islamic Revolutionary Guard under the guise of an Iranian company called the Mabda Institute, where they were leaders, contractors, associates, or, well, just plain hired hackers. The hackers stole intellectual property from the universities, including academic journals, theses, dissertations, and e-books. 
Other U.S. victims included three academic publishers, two media and entertainment companies, one law firm, 11 technology companies, five consulting firms, four marketing firms, two banking and or investment firms, two online car sales companies, and believe it or not, a bunch of other victims that were even more random. Well, Google may prioritize stories for paying new subscribers. Our friends at Google plan to prioritize news articles in search results for users who already subscribe to those news outlets, Bloomberg reported last Tuesday. The Alphabet unit will also begin sharing data with media companies on who's most likely to buy a subscription, Bloomberg reported, and was citing anonymous sources. The initiative, expected to be unveiled at an event on March 20th in New York, aims to help media companies find and retain paying customers. As readers have increasingly gone online for their news, newspapers have suffered declining subscriber numbers and lower advertising revenue, resulting in a dramatic industry contraction. Many newspaper publishers have blamed Google and other news aggregation sites for their woes and have focused on getting readers to pay for their content. I, for one, think this is a double-edged sword. On one hand, dwindling advertising dollars have meant the demise of many great journalistic outlets. But on the other hand, I've also complained about the lack of intelligence to online clicking. Such a program could potentially mean a comeback for more sophisticated news outlets. So the world is changing, and I guess only time will tell whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. <clears throat> Remember Boston Dynamics and Shaft with their creepy bipedal robots that can't get knocked over? Well, this past couple days, a newcomer, Agility Robots, has announced $8 million in Series A funding to accelerate their product, technology, and business development. This looks to be the first robotics company to get such a significant amount of VC funding to develop a realistic commercial bipedal robot. Per some of the investors, they believe that Agility's architecture is radically different than the conventional bipedal systems. The agility team has spent over a decade to research, discover, and understand the fundamental principles of animal morphology and locomotion behavior to design an energy-efficient bipedal system. What's the difference from some of the like Boston Dynamics tech? Well, agility has developed a novel architecture that leverages a passive dynamic and mechanically embodies a spring-massive model to achieve human-like gait dynamics. What problems will these types of robots solve? Well, Agility thinks that the robots of this nature will be able to achieve tasks that wheeled platforms just cannot do, and they will be more energy efficient doing so. It's only a matter of time where the robots will take over. Well, malware authors have discovered agile development. Ransomware developers have been busy and in some cases moving their craft forward with techniques used in enterprise software development. According to researchers at Checkpoint, that's what the creators of a ransomware variant called GANDCRAB, or GANDCRAB, depending on which researchers you're following, are doing. The way that it's developed and maintained looks very much like the agile development discipline used in many enterprise development shops today. Rather than releasing well-tested malware, GANDCRAB's developers release software with significant flaws. For example, one made it easy to decrypt GANDCRAB's encrypted files without paying the ransom, but then they rapidly iterate new versions to solve the problems and evade new techniques for detecting the malware. In addition, Checkpoint researchers say the malware authors are acknowledging the help they're getting from the research community. Their logs are full of the names of researchers, so they're in a constant dialogue with the people researching them, and they've even included the names of researchers in domain names as a way of, well, honoring the successful takedowns. New York says Charter Communications lied about new broadband and is threatening to revoke their franchise. New York government officials have threatened to terminate Charter Communications franchise agreements with New York City, saying the cable company failed to meet broadband construction requirements and may not have paid all of its required franchise fees. The New York Public Service, Com Service Commission said Charter should pay a $1 million fine for missing a deadline to expand its broadband network statewide and is questioning Charter over declines in franchise fees paid to New York City. The allegations related both to Charter's 2011 franchise agreements with New York City and statewide commitments Charter made in order to get state approval of its 2016 acquisition of Time Warner Cable, TWC. Charter told the commission that it met the latest merger build-out deadline, but a detailed audit by the commission staff found more than 14,000 passings claimed by Charter for its December milestone were ineligible. 
causing Charter to fall short of the milestone by more than 8,000 passings, the commission said. Charter claimed that it met the TWC merger build-out commitments in part by expanding services in New York City, but Charter's new broadband deployments in New York City, including addresses that the company had already required to serve as part of the franchise agreements, the commission said. Now, well, my spin on this is Charter is trying to double count some locations in order to meet their required numbers and avoid greater expenditures in rolling out to less profitable areas in the city. So physical access to device leaves that device open to many different types of attacks. Well, this is also true for supply chain attacks. This particular attack came from a 15-year-old programmer named Salim Rashid, discovered a flaw in the popular Ledger hardware wallet, which allows hackers to grab secret pins before or after the device was shipped. So these vulnerabilities allows for both what they call a supply chain attack, meaning attack that could compromise the device before it was shipped to the customer, and another attack that could allow the hacker to steal private keys after the device was initialized. By having physical access to the device before a generation of a seed, an attacker could fool the device by injecting, injecting his seed inside instead of generating a new one. The most, the most likely scenario would be a scam operation from a shady, re shady reseller. So lesson learned, maybe don't buy CD devices from guys and their coats on the corner. <laughs> well, folks, that does it for the blips. And next up, we're getting into the bites, and we have a couple fun ones. But first, we couldn't do this with Canada Price Tech without our supporters and our sponsors, and this one is no exception. Padre? We'll get right back to the action, but first, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now, let me ask you a question. If you've ever gone in for a mortgage for your home, did you like the experience? Was it fun? Would you repeat it? Well, of course you wouldn't because it was probably horrible. I mean, the mortgage experience just hasn't been updated in how many decades. It's still that process of you dragging out your old receipts and old banker's boxes, trying to convince some complete stranger at the bank that you're worthy of a loan. Well, folks, you don't have to suffer through that pain because today there's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Now, the mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated and it needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. No more bankers' boxes filled with old receipts. We live in a digital world, and Rocket Mortgage is digital. It's powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in just seconds. And with those calculations, based on your income, your assets, and your credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and then find the one that's just right for you. It's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, and mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. That's rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. Equal housing lender license in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now let's get back to the goodness with the Twyatt crew. Thank you, Padre, and thank you to our sponsor. Let's go ahead and jump into the bites. So this past week, the FCC passed a measure that actually exempts small radio deployments from the federal environmental and historical preservation reviews originally meant for large cell phone towers. The order focused on types of deployment that are subject to historical Preservation Act, the National Historical Preservation Act, and the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, reviews. So the normal process when you're trying to deploy a cell phone tower is you go through the approval from state and local governments, uh, as well as you have to be compliant of the FCC rules, which include the National Environment Policy, as well as which includes the Environmental or Endangered Species Act, as well as NHPA. And depending on the height of the tower, you actually have to be able to go through Federal uh, Aviation Administration as well as the antenna structure registration. So there's a lot of stuff you have to kind of go through when you normally set up a tower. Well, with these added uh, requirements, when you have to go through the National Environmental Policy, you have to go through uh, reviews around wildlife, wild uh, wilderness areas, wildlife preserves, endangered species, floodplains, wetlands, so on and so forth. So 
this exemption actually does for cell phone companies is that it does not affect the uh, it affects them in a way where they don't actually have to go through the reviews anymore. So they, uh, what it doesn't affect though is local and city governments might still want to actually go through some reviews. So they're actually going to go and review this at a later date and see if they can kind of remove those as well. So last year alone, let's put this in perspective. Last year alone, wireless operators spent about thirty-six million dollars on these reviews, and it was guesstimated that due to the ramp up of the new 5G network, that this might actually cost them up to a total of $240 million in the next year. So of course, there's also multiple points of views. And the other side talks about the fact that the environmental and historical preservation values of the guidelines and requirements shouldn't be removed. Uh, and this is even also above the fact that there was only 1% of the cases reviewed actually changed or forced changed their deployments in those areas. So obviously the mobile uh, companies feel that this is a foot in the right direction and they feel that it will really help reduce the cost of the new 5G deployments. And the fact is 5G deployments might just be these small pizza sized box appliances that they can essentially put up in a couple hours and they don't want to be under the same scrutiny as these 200 foot cell towers. It's definitely, they definitely feel it's going to save them money. And obviously in this day and age, these votes weren't without controversy. There was a three, two to, three to two vote split along the party lines with two Democrats dissenting. And this view of the process, they feel it definitely should be some kind of process should be in place for these types of deployments, whether it be tall or small. Now, we've heard about 5G technology coming out. Obviously, in Mobile World Conference, we talked about many 5G chips coming out to support these networks. But obviously, we need to get the networks out there as well. So, Curtis, I want to bring it to you first. I think this is something interesting. Do we feel that by just reducing this and removing this requirement, this so-called red tape, do you think it'll actually make a difference in the rollout of 5G and make it faster now? Well, interestingly enough, I think that the kind of red tape they're talking about getting rid of, the, um, the small cell um, red tape, is less likely to have an impact on spreading 5G to where it's not uh, because the small scale stuff is going to primarily be deployed in in areas of greater density you know you want to provide additional capacity in an already uh, lit up area then the small cells are a good way to do that so i think what it probably will do is improve 5g in the more populated areas where it already exists. Now, could you use the smaller uh, cells out in remote areas? Uh, yes, you can. But I think there again, we're talking about perhaps small towns rather than truly rural areas. So I, I think this is depending on exactly how you're defining the things that you're talking about. Will it improve 5G? Probably so. But most of that improvement, I think, will go to areas that already have some degree of 5G now. Um, and frankly, when I look at what's being eliminated in terms of red tape and where it's likely to have an effect, I think the biggest improvement is likely to be to the bottom line of the 5G companies. Absolutely. So the, the you know, going on what Curtis said, I mean, the technology is different. So Brian, is you know, is this is this going to change? Like he. Deploying in the rural areas, is that really a, a thing that 5G is attempting to target? Like, would it be useful for them to deploy to fi 5G to this type of environment, um, you know, because well, of the technology limitation? I think a lot of the issue is that the uh, 5G microcells are considerably less power hungry and less intensive on antennas because they're covering a smaller area. Um, one of the big issues is for everyone that's going to be playing this game is backhaul. You know, everybody keems, seems to forget that wireless technology needs wire. And so a lot of these uh, wireless service, internet service providers are actually also providing backhaul services. So there's actually a 60 gigahertz um, system deploying in the greater Honolulu metro area that's going to be a combination of being able to go and put a wireless access point of some sort on your home or business, but they're actually targeting um, the 5G, 4G and 5G uh, cell towers as the low-hanging fruit because that way they don't have to have fiber dragged in and things like that. Now, <clears throat> as for the ruling on red tape, 
one of the things that's probably going to come up is I'm sure the folks, the congressional delegation in Hawaii is going to be up in arms. Um, you can't swing a cat in Hawaii without finding a historical site. And so that is going to be really interesting. Um, I'm sure the same thing happens when you start getting on the edges of Indian reservations and things like that. I'm not sure cutting all that red tape is necessarily a good thing. Uh, I think there should be at least a drive to reduce the red tape. I, I would like to see that. But I don't want it at the expense of historical sites. You know, having a antenna on the side of, say, Buckingham Palace is probably not going to make everybody happy. Or having cell phone towers suddenly sprouting up on the Eiffel Tower. That's the other side of the coin you have to take a good hard look at. And we're going to need more of these. The 5G microcells are going to cover a significantly smaller space. Now, by having this separation, you can get much, much larger amounts of people covered. But you also need more towers, more micro towers. And, you know, it's nice that they're the size of a pizza box, so they're easy and cheap. You might have people, you know, sell companies renting some space from uh, particularly tall homes, you know, get a little bit of rent. So this is going to be interesting. Um, this is, again, another wait and see. I think the uh, folks like the dissenting vote from FCC Commissioner Rosen Warshall um, said she agreed that the review process for 5G infrastructure needs to be streamlined, but she said the same process for larger cell infrastructure also needs to be modernized. She added that the FCC's effort, which also purports to increase deployment in rural areas, misses the mark. Go girl. <laughs> so you brought up something very interesting. I think I, I personally think that uh, obviously they didn't take away state and local government restrictions. So obviously uh, the federal uh, is going to reduce costs there for mo for you know for for deployment. But when it comes to state and local. They can still have restrictions and review process and so on and so forth. Curtis, I want to throw this over to you. One thing that I'm interested about is to, to have these restrictions in place, especially at the federal level, it's almost a deterrent for, or actually not a deterrent, it's to kind of and say it's a forcing function for companies to kind of do the right thing up front rather than having to get, you know, uh, a violation and have to go fix something about a deployment. So they follow these, these, these regulations up front so that the that this way their cost later is less. And if you take those away, they might not necessarily have to follow those regulations. And so they might not do the right thing the first time. Do you think it's something like that that might happen with some of these? So in order to reduce their cost even more? I think it's possible. And, and let's remember as well that in many cases, in virtually all cases, the, the jurisdiction that that controls things is the federal government when it comes to anything having to do with with radio frequency things. Now, when it comes to antennas, there can be some state and local regulation. To this point, we've seen federal regulation supersede the vast majority of those. As a matter of fact, many localities haven't bothered to have their own regulation because they felt that the uh, federal regulations were covering things. If we see dramatic rollback on what the federal regulations are doing, then I think that does invite some of the municipalities, some of the states to step in and have their own tighter regulations. And at that point, the good folks at uh, the FCC um, are going to probably end up with going in and saying, um, let's come up with new regulations that will prevent cities and states from having greater regulation. Um, you know, it, it's it's one of these things where there is going to be some kind of control on what the, the providers, the 5G providers can do. The question is whether they want to deal with one unified set of regulations nationwide or deal with the patchwork that's going to ensue if the federals, uh, the FCC ends up loosening, well, We'll call it too much, although, as we've seen, that's a point of debate. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll have to see what happens. 
Well, that does for the bites because I want to I want to get us into the favorite part of the show for me, and that's to bring in a guest and drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And today is no exception. We have Mr. David Ting, the VP of Engineering of Data Visor. David, thank you so much for coming and being on this weekend at Rise Tech. Well, it's an honor to be a show on the show. Thank you so much for the invitation. So you you have quite a bit of history in this industry, including Alta Vista, Yahoo, the gaming industries, mobile payments, and so on and so forth. Could you just give us a little bit of insight about you and what kind of work you're doing? Sure. Um, I'm always interested in new forms of technology. So back in the days, internet, mobile, and I think the next trend is going to be AI. So I'm privileged to be in a position to work with a bunch of extremely intelligent individuals at DataVisor to try to make some breakthrough here, uh, especially on the fraud prevention front. Fantastic. So you kind of alluded to this a little bit, DataVisor, obviously we're talking fraud detection and using AI um, and unsupervised AI learning. Can you just talk about a little bit from the surface what DataVisor is and what kind of task is trying to prove and what kind of issues is trying to solve? Sure. So if you look at the traditional form of uh, security, you always uh, try to protect information at the edge. So you think about like preventing data breaches, you're trying to block uh, unauthorized access into your network. But then if you look at um, how the new forms of attacks, you always wonder, um, what do people do with the information that they steal? Um, how do they make money from it? And DataVisor is a solution that actually um, to, that's worked as uh, trying to prevent those type of attacks. So what we do is we work at the data warehouse and data lake level. So we look for across all of the users in the systems and all of the features and, um, and then try to find similarities. What we find is, is, is that with these programmatic attacks, there's always digital fingerprints where um, there's a lot of similarities between those access. For example, if somebody is trying to register, maybe all the registrants are coming from the same region in the world. They may be coming in and um, uh, faking an install on the mobile app. And then during that period, um, you know, they, they may actually um, be uh, installing and then also opening the app and go through the tutorial in the same amount of time or too fast for a human to work on. So with these type of patterns, we can actually better protect use cases where once um, a hacker can fake as a user, a legitimate user, um, you know, the damage it can cause to an organization. Interesting. So... Why don't you talk a little bit about, I think there's a bunch of companies actually using this today. Um, we have a laundry list of them uh, out there that are using, uh, I think it was uh, Pinterest and Yelp and uh, Cheetah Mobile and all these other ones. So how are they using it in some of their businesses? So there are uh, different use cases. So maybe let's actually talk about Yelp and Pinterest. So as you know, a lot of the restaurants and small businesses are very dependent on Yelp. Uh, because they're like the you know yellow pages of today. Um, so uh, one problem we try to help them with is like fake reviews. So if you open a new restaurant, your competitors may come in, or they may hire some hackers to come in to taint the reputation of restaurants. Um, so that's actually one form of attack of many that we prevent. Uh, for King, for example, they make Candy Crush. So what we do for them is is that we try to reduce the amount of fraudulent installs where hackers actually um, uh, monetized by faking installs or gameplay uh, to um, gain money from their advertising dollars. So those, uh, we try to make it so that their spend is more efficient. Uh, another form is e-commerce. So we have a few clients uh, with e-commerce scenarios uh, where, you, uh, for example, one of the biggest um, e-commerce companies in China, JD.com, um, they use uh, us for promotional um, fr uh, fraud detection. For example, first time user, they may have a coupon um, to get 20 percent off. So one of the common scenarios will be people will be buying wares um, and uh, everything at 20 percent off. And, uh, and then this is uh, something that we can help them block and invalidate the coupon after registration. Interesting. Fantastic. So, um, so, so something you kind of mentioned in the beginning, you talked a little bit about AI and some of the, the models they're using. You're, you talked about unsupervised machine learning. So we talked about it before in some other shows. We talked about just standard machine learning. What, what's the difference? What is unsupervised machine learning and how is it different from some of the other models out there today? Great. Um, that's actually a really good question. So if you look at traditional machine learning, what it does is, is that you have to train it. 
So what it means is, is that if you have information flowing in, you have to tell the machine what is good, what's bad. So unsupervised machine learning is actually another form of machine learning where it learns on the fly. So what it does is it, uh, for us in a security front, we look for clusters of activity. So for a particular user, if they perform, a group of people perform the same action, and that action looks suspicious as you, um, as you uh, kind of extrapolate it through timeline and look at uh, what they perform. Uh, and if there's too much similarity, then likely it's actually an attack pattern. So um, there's pros and cons of both, um, both sides. So uh, the pros of supervised machine learning is once you have a lot of information, a lot of good labels, meaning like um, this is trustworthy, good or bad dispositions for a particular user, the model becomes very reliable and very effective. In an unsupervised world, um, the beauty is, is that you don't need to have a lot of data to get started, um, um, like meaning label data. You don't actually, in theory, you don't have to have any at all. For the use cases that we're familiar with, uh, such as mass registration uh, or a town takeover, in those use cases, we already trained a model. So it can implement with uh, no training, uh, no data, and uh, we can actually disposition um, a user being good or bad, and we tune it. Uh, to be higher precision or coverage based on either expert opinion or uh, small amount of label data. So it's faster to get started. So if you look at most use cases in organization, um, you actually would want to use both because there's pros and cons of both. And uh, at Datavisor, we really specialize in unsupervised machine learning with quite uh, a few patents around this area. Um, because if you look at the fundamental computing problem, it's actually quite difficult. So what I just uh, talked about is um, a particular user may have thousands of attributes associated with them. And then you can have derived attributes. Um, so, and then if you combine them, you're looking for clusters of these attributes and then likelihood of activity across the users. So it's really like a um, big O of N squared type problems. As the number of users in your system increases, the computational complexity actually grows very quickly. So what we specialize in is, is um, try to reduce the com uh, computational um, complexity complexity with our um, patents. Um, um, and then what we also do is, is up to a point that uh, for most use cases, uh, we can actually disposition a user in real time. That's very cool. So you, you talked a little bit of some scenarios, some use cases where you don't necessarily even have to train the model to make it mm -hmm. useful. I guess we have had some questions out there where, you know, is, is big data more success, susceptible to fraud and if so, why? Why is it because there's just more data there? It has more, more, more things for the model to handle. Like, what is it out there that that's more susceptible, and and why? So if you're in the InfoSec group of any company, one of the best practices is that you want to figure out where your attack surface is, right? So, um, so the the way to look at it is is that if I were a hacker, what are some of the scenarios where I can generate profit? Uh, from whichever business that you have, right? So if you're a BBC company, um, if you're selling items, um, you know, what are the types of attacks that can actually uh, generate the maximum profit with the least amount of effort? And that's usually how the hackers think. And uh, if you look at the programming tool, I'm actually glad that there's a live example of agile programming. Um, and then like two years ago, um, actually in Black Hat Conference, um, one of the winners actually show using AI in the tax. Uh, what it means is, is that traditional forms of, um, of blocking, which creates a sense of secu uh, security for you, are rules-based. So what will happen is, is I'll give you some simple examples. So if you set up a rule on a firewall, maybe you look at the attacks being originated from a certain set of IPs or certain region around the world, um, and you block it and you feel like you're safe. Um, and the new forms of attack actually would use that, uh, like using AI principles, and they morph. So they will learn on which attacks are being blocked, and they will try and, uh, and then try to basically open up different parameters until they can come through. So if you, again, going back to the InfoSec side, um, you know, you should actually go through use cases where you think through and look at um, what your organization is susceptible of and how much damage could be created. If such a form of attack actually morphs as a good user, gets into your system, and what type of damage would it cause? 
Very cool. So, Brian, um, you had some questions about some of the deployment models for this, right? You know, we always got to ask because it's always going to come up as a question. Is this something that our viewers could do on premise or is this something that has to be in the cloud? Um, that's a great question. So we actually do both. So we um, have a, quite a few clients that are on premise and we have a number of clients that are in the cloud as well. Um, let's talk about the advantages of each and um, and then uh, we can talk about like um, why one may be better than the other and it differs from company to company. So on premise, um, it definitely is more secure. It's in your own data center. So if you have PI information, if you think about how you train the model, the more information that this model has, the more cross correlation that we can run, the more accurate it is in predicting the forms of the attack. So if you provide um, some information like such as email, name, et cetera, et cetera, um, it will actually help. Um, in catching uh, the fraudsters. Um, so an on press model uh, definitely is more secure. Um, but um, if you look at um, why the cloud could be superior is, is that on-premise, there is quite a bit of investment to go in to get all of the hardware. It basically is proportional to the size of the information that you have in your system. So like I said, it's close to an N-squared problem. Even we know uh, we got it to a size of N. Um, the number of servers you need, we use uh, uh, Spark um, as a main engine to do the computation. So the number of servers that you run is actually quite high if you have, um, like, say, hundreds of millions of users like some of our customers do. Um, so the beauty of the cloud is, is that um, it's scalable. So as your business grows, um, the solution scales with you. And then also in forms of attacks, it's not constant. Um, for example, there's something called Singles Day um, uh, in China where it's almost like Black Friday. Um, and one of the clients we talked to is, is, is that they, at peak, they actually have 2 million transactions per second. And uh, I had to ask the question multiple times to make sure I got it right. And, um, and if you have to build your own hardware at peak without leveraging the cloud, it's actually a fairly invest, um, heavy investment. So cloud is actually faster to deploy. Slightly less secure, um, but then also um, it is actually easy to scale. So you don't have to have the hardware infrastructure built um, for the you know the maximum form of scalability, to, which is usually like you build like two x capacity from previous year's peak, right? So which is could be a heavy uh, hardware investment. David, this is Kurt. I'd like to ask a question that that plays with a couple of things you just said in that answer. Um, we know that when it comes to, for example, sensitive data, it's quite possible to yes. take two pieces of unclassified data, put them together, and end up with something that's, that's sensitive or classified. Yes. Using your system, is it possible that you could take bits and pieces of information that were not personally sensitive, but synthesize something that was? And if that happens, then does that have an impact on whether someone chooses to deploy in the cloud or on premises? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you look at it, our algorithm actually works uh, with encryption. Like say, for example, if you don't want to provide the IP address, the clustering algorithm actually still works if uh, the hashing is done where, you know, spatially um, the distribution is approximately the same. So uh, we can deal with sensitive information that's encrypted, but it could be more accurate when it's unencrypted. But because if you look at an address such as like email address, for example, a lot of the hackers are lazy. So it's usually like maybe a name from a dictionary, adding digits behind it, random digits behind it, or even sequential digits behind it. And then uh, when they actually have a massive registration scenario where they register a bunch of user, uh, kind of have it as a sleeper cell, as we call it, incubate it for a period of time, let it sit dormant for like six months to a few years before the attack happens. Um, and then going back to your um, multiple forms of information, pieces of information, creating it to make it sensitive, we feel like um, we haven't seen much, uh, many examples of that. Um, really, um, it's more of um, it, the comfort of the client where um, how much are they willing to share? How how big of an impact can we do for their business? And that usually sometimes drives more of 
uh, how much information we can practice, um, we can actually get access to. Also, um, let me also address security a little bit on the cloud because um, I made it sound a little bit insecure, but I'm just talking about on-prem is slightly more secure than in the cloud. Um, so cloud, we actually abide by what's called the SOC 2 standard. Uh, so we basically encrypt the data in transit and at rest. That's basically part of the standard. Um, and so that if you look at the information in general, there's a lot of procedures and controls in place to make sure they're um, safely kept. And then we act as a role of a processor so that um, what happened is after the data comes in, we um, digest it and we send back the result. And some of the information do get purged as an archival period associated with it. So, um, so from a data security perspective, um, you know, we try to use, utilize all the best practices to really um, try to take good care of it in the cloud. Okay, so say we've implemented this, I'm selling widgets and I'd like to only ship widgets to legitimate customers. Um, how as I, as a customer, how do I deal with things like false positives or false negatives? Is What kind of tuning process do I have access to? That's a great, uh, great question. So in our detection engine, uh, when we come back, we come back with a confidence score of the detection. So it's a number from zero to one. Um, when it's one, we're very confident this person is fraudulent. So most of our customers actually use um, kind of like gradually implement it into production. So let me give you an example. So what would happen is, is, is that um, they will actually look at the high conference user, do a manual review. Um, and then once they sh they're sure to gain confidence that our engine is calibrated, where the false positives and false negative are within acceptable range, then they roll out to production. There are other forms of customers actually are a bit, um, they actually have different forms of disposition. So of course, the most strict form is that you block a user. So you're preventing them from using the system. What other people do also is, is that um, they may actually still let them be part of the ecosystem, but then restrict the access they have. Uh, so for example, if you're posting a review and we notice that it's a fraudulent review, that review may not show up in the system where that score may not be added into the score of that particular restaurant. So really how the score is used by the customer is really dependent on, you know, how our engines results and how comfortable are they are with our detection result to do the proper disposition because it triggers an action on their side. And that action is completely configurable and flexible. Fantastic. So Obviously, we've heard about the GDPR, the general data protection regulations that are coming out. So you talked a little bit about how sometimes, you obviously, you follow the normal policies and protocols and protections that some of the other policies have. But with GDPR, if data is at rest and it's not purged over time, you talked a little bit about how data is archived and maybe not purged. Is, is this kind of changing your business somewhat and, and how you kind of handle GDPR? Um, yeah, GDPR definitely is going to change the way our customer deal with data because they actually affect the B2C company much more than B2B companies. So in the GDPR world, we're, um, we're kind of in the form of being a data processor. Uh, so what that means is, is that um, we provide a service to the people who collect the information. So our rule of thumb, and for people who are in our state, it's actually rule of thumb is actually quite simple because there are legal regulations in China and other countries that follows uh, some of the principles and best practice GDPR. Uh, where, where we receive the data, we try to keep the data in that region. So for example, if we receive the data, say in the EU for GDPR, we will keep the data, have it reside in the EU and process in the EU. Um, and, then, um, and then that actually uh, is actually one of the biggest restrictions that we see. And what that means is, is that uh, instead of having one cloud that can host them all, uh, we actually will have, um, you know, cloud dispersed around the world regionally, pending on, you know, um, kind of like country-based regulations. Um, so that's how it's affecting us. Fantastic. So one quick question. We always have this, this, this question that we ask everyone around how does, you know, one enterprise or business kind of get started if they wanted a certain size deployment and they wanted to get moving on it and they wanted to utilize this system? What's kind of the process that they follow? 
you know, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud? Where do they get started? Yeah, so the easiest form uh, way to get started, uh, just to see if this works and has a strong ROI for your business, is to work with us. Uh, we have two forms of way that data can be transferred. One is uh, what we call batch, so where you give us um, kind of like sample files. Uh, we'll run through it, analyze the sample file, and we disposition, provide results to you, and review the results on the users that we detected and what patterns we see from the data that has been provided. That has been extremely successful for people that uh, we re engage with, um, and they can see the immediate value in the ROI for that particular project very quickly. Um, for also touched on, like we do handle disposition real time as well. So we have very well documented APIs. Uh, where people can call us, um, and once the model is set, we disposition that user as well um, and give back the confidence score. Um, that process follows similar um, type of procedure uh, where we uh, work with you on a set of data, train the model, and then basically work with you to make sure it's um, effective and then roll out to production. On-prem, uh, there's one extra step because um, uh, we do use containers uh, for our technology. So we have automated install script and pretty detailed instructions to help you set up in your own data center. But what we find is, is that regulations around data center and access around data center is a bit different. For example, our script basically need admin access, but then it serves as a really good um, set of commands for somebody to run manually if admin access is removed from the host um, that, um, that we can get access to, we use Docker. Um, so, um, so we found organizations that use very own forms of Linux that does not support Docker. So they will have to install the pieces of software by hand. So all I'm saying is, is, is that that extra step basically involves a bit more time to market. Um, and the startup time is actually quite uh, a lot longer than uh, a cloud-based scenario. So one interesting question that we got from the, the chat room is, is is around the question of data sources. So where can you where can you pull data? Can you you know can you give it unstructured data from databases? Can you hook it up? Like how do you what's the process of kind of getting your data stream into the system and being allowing to That's ingest it. and process it? That's a great question. Uh, we do have uh, data guidelines. Uh, so for what we call user acquisition model. We actually tap into the attribution network. So you really don't need to do anything. Uh, so when I talked about mobile fraud, uh, we have partners in um, say Adjust, App, um, App Flyer, uh, et cetera, et cetera, Tune. Um, and uh, what will happen is you just have to give us permission. We pull the data directly from the attribution network and we can analyze the results and get it back to you uh, without you doing anything. But for most other forms, uh, we deal with unstructured data as well as structured data. We don't require you to do a transformation. So uh, what we call our trials team actually um, will work with you to map the data to our data schema and then uh, and also calibrate the model and try to work with you with your use case. Um, so it's a uh, fairly lightweight. Uh, it's more of um, getting good quality data uh, the challenge that we have, for example, um, we use digi digital fingerprints a lot. So like say uh, IP address, user agent string, they're really good uh, fields to use for detection. What we find is, is that if the data source is corrupt, meaning like the IP address, there's a lot of nulls in that field. That does cause issues and it requires a little bit of extra work to clean up. Fantastic. So one of the other questions, and this is kind of like a different type of question, but you know, kind of getting your thoughts on this is, you know, what can businesses and enterprises do now? Obviously, using data is one of them, but what can they also do to kind of to avoid fraud um, and their and potentially even breaches in their system? What's kind of the best kind of maybe top three tips? Um, really good question. So I always look at MVP as a developer, right? So um, the minimal viable product is really. Like what I said, go through the thought exercise, looking at areas uh, where there could be potential damage, and then do some queries, just ad hoc queries in the system, and then see if there are traces of those. Um, the first form of um, 
of uh, protection is um, basically build a simplified rules engine to block those. As I said, uh, the more sophisticated attackers will know how to work around the system. Also, a lot of the forms of attacks, um, it's hard to trace because they look really like legitimate traffic until you do the clustering forms analysis that I um, that I described earlier that Datavisor does. Um, it's really hard to find this pattern. But this MVP will give you a pretty immediate ROI. It's a great way to just get started and um, at least quantifying if your business is susceptible to this type of attack. And having rules will trigger at least some alarms in the system uh, so that if an attack happens, at least you know like something is there. Um, so I would do uh, things like um, kind of like the similar type of uh, monitoring that you use for uh, infrastructure. Like if there's um, irregular traffic patterns where there's too much traffic coming from a particular region, um, if there's a spike of traffic that's not related to any marketing event, those are all likely forms of uh, attacks that could be happening in your system. And then, um, and also take the rules of um, not thinking that um, like your firewall or like your VPC rule, access rule is gonna, gonna actually help you to uh, prevent these attacks because most forms of the attack actually address themselves as legitimate users. Visit your business rules. Um, like for example, like the e-commerce promotion example, uh, does it make sense to give a huge discount, like uh, say 50% off on your first order or start small, um, like a 10% off and increment over time because the 50% off likely will generate, you know, attract more hackers uh, just because they can actually uh, get more value in return for the same amount of work. Um, and then think through it, at least from an analytical standpoint like that. David, I had a question to to ask about your your basic products, and and this gets to a a, a phrase that you're using. Uh, we hear a lot about, of course, artificial intelligence. We also hear about machine intelligence and machine learning. You very consciously chose artificial intelligence for what you're doing. Why did you choose that label versus one of the others? Yes, um, we. I feel like machine learning uh, is traditionally used for supervised, um, where we um, we actually have um, a, a form of very well labeled information. You train it; it learns over time. So you teach the machine. So I use a little bit more AI, and we're still um, in the early phases of our development out of the potential of what we could do over time. The form is because with unsupervised machine learning, the reason why I use AI is it actually discover new forms of attack. So I'll give you an example. So in supervised machine learning in traditional financial institution, you can actually use chargebacks. And then what will happen is after the, you know, you figure out there's a ton of chargebacks, you can work backwards, you find a group of users, and then you, um, use rules to block them, right? So the issue here is that it may take uh, one to two months to block it. So your organization actually is susceptible for all the damages that happen in the last you know, few months. So it's very uh, slow. So that form is still good because it's absolutely precise when you have great labels such as chargeback. But then what, the reason why I label Datavisor as AI is that you also need some intelligence in the system. We have a product called the Automated Rules Engine, for example, where we look for the suspicious activity and we insert rules automatically into the rules engine to help disposition. We also use our unsupervised machine learning to look at new trends. Um, be so people switching values, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those type of attacks were really good at uh, morphing our defense and be still being able to defend, uh, um, kind of capture these type of hackers and label it uh, and create alerts. So with the combination of the two, we do um, use supervised in combination, unsupervised machine learning in, um, in quite a few use cases as well. We, we feel like that's the best form of defense where you learn through uh, reliable labels and then you also learn by people utilizing, you know, pattern-based attacks against your system so they can learn on their own. Right. So, you know, obviously we heard that in this past February, you guys received your Series C financing. Fantastic. And we know we've heard that in fraud detection, the prevention market is said to be almost worth $42 billion by 2022. 
So we're just curious. Maybe we'll give, give you some chance to kind of talk a little bit about Datavisor. We're hearing that maybe you're moving to different markets. What we maybe what some other features you're kind of working on and some other things that Datavisor does. That's great. Thank you for providing a marketing opportunity for me, an engineer. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. So a couple of things here. Um, so Datavisor, we're lucky to get the Series C from Sequoia, China, and uh, and what we're doing is we're investing heavily in our product. So we're uh, looking at doubling size of the company. Um, you know, for me, selfishly speaking, we're um, more than doubling our engineering team. So we have more uh, technologists um, working on the product itself and try to push the envelope of our technology. So just a marketing blip for the engineering team uh, as well as the rest of the data advisor. We're actually hiring quite aggressively. So if you feel like uh, uh, you could be a fit, uh, we have positions for people who are new to big data and AI. And we have positions who are extreme experts. So we're hiring all different ranges. So um, if you are a good coder, um, I think we're looking for people who are hardworking and code well, and you, you possibly have a fit on the team. Um, talking about the company and the company's trajectory, um, we believe that fraud protection is our first use case. So there are additional use cases that could be very helpful. Uh, so for example, if you just look at the polar opposite of fraudster, are really good users. Um, so what we are doing with some clients are some research and experiment on trying to find out that instead of preventing fraudsters in the system, we're trying to magnify their marketing spend by uh, looking for good users and patterns of good users on the system and do prediction where they can funnel the money on effective channel much faster than their traditional techniques and analysis. Um, so that's uh, one form. We're also looking at different sectors all the time because um, there's a lot of applications for unsupervised machine learning. And, uh, and then what we feel is, is that, uh, um, you know, this could be applicable for, um, uh, say, anti-money laundering. So we're working through some uh, prototypes on those. Uh, there are also um, potential uh, insurance and medical use cases as well. Uh, so... So yeah, so uh, uh, again, like what I said in the beginning, um, we're really scratching the surface and I, I think there's a lot of work to do uh, to really perfect the promise of the company. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've wasted another hour on the best dang enterprise show, according to 9 out of 10 fraud events. Of course, I first want to thank my guest, Mr. David Ting, the VP of Engineering for Datavisor. David, thank you so much for coming on this week at Enterprise Tech. Can you tell the audience where we can find you and your work and anything about Datavisor? Sure. Uh, of course, you can come to our website at uh, datavisor.com. Uh, you can learn more about our product as well as apply for the jobs that we have open on the site. Um, and then also, like myself, um, I'm on Twitter, on DTing888. Uh, as well as I use LinkedIn pretty prevalently as well as uh, so if you search for David Ting Datavisor, there's only one David Ting and Datavisor uh, right now. So so you should be able to find me. Fantastic. David, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Of course, thank you to my co-host as well. This the show, they, they're basically what makes the show fun. And so I want to, of course, start with my tireless producer of this weekend at Price Tech, Mr. Brian Chi. He's the director of Advanced Network Computer Laboratory in Honolulu. Chi, where can you tell folks at home where they can find you and your work? Well, my Twitter is A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. And um, I'm also Chibert at twit.tv. I want to do a fast shout out to uh, Datavisor's PR person, Chris Craves. Chris, thank you so much. Um, we had some, uh, shall we say, shuffling to do. And uh, Chris, thank you very much. And, you know, we couldn't do this without our audience. We've been getting all kinds of really great uh, feedback from you folks and uh, if you have show suggestions I will try and hunt for those um, someone asked me a question about trying to do a story on what it takes to get that last mile internet service provider uh, type connections in different countries uh, wow that's a great one that's going to be a challenge um, but I am working on seeing if we can do something like that and lastly, 
I want to say thank you very much to Alex for stepping in. Thanks, Alex. You're very welcome. Alex. <laughs> of course, we also have to thank Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, can you tell the folks at home what you're doing, what you're working on lately? Well, I've got a bunch of good stories coming up at uh, Dark Reading. Uh, it's a good thing for me, bad for the rest of the world, that the, uh, the bad guys just keep plugging away at uh, all of our security systems. Uh, I've got some uh, some kind of neat trend stories and uh, analysis coming up in the next week over at Dark Reading. So please look for me there. Follow me on Twitter at KG4GWA. And the next time I'm going to be out in the wild, uh, probably going to be April out at RSA in San Francisco. So if you're going to be out at RSA, um, please ping me on Twitter. Would love to uh, have a chance to meet in real space. Fantastic. Thank you, Curtis. You guys are what make this show great. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially thank you to Lisa, so Lisa and Leo for letting us do this show week after week and giving us support. Of course, thank you to all the engineers. And of course, folks, thank you to you. You tune in each and every week for allowing us to do this show. And without you, we wouldn't be able to do this show. So you know what? Go ahead and jump over that twit.tv slash twiet and you'll find all of our back episodes as well as all of our full episodes and all the show names and guests that were on the show, some topics as well as you can also hit those magic buttons to the left, I'm sorry, to the right there, where you can subscribe to any format, both audio, video, HD audio, HD video, for your phone, tablet, laptop. And remember also, we do this show each and every week live at 1.30 Pacific, and you can join us here at live.twit.tv. And of course, if you're going to jump in and, and watch us live, you might as well jump into our chat room and talk to people there, some of the amazing people there at irc.twit.tv, and you can help essentially direct the show. Also, don't forget to follow me on twitter.com slash luam. And of course, all my work that I do at Microsoft is at dev.office.com. Check out all the new stuff that we're working on. Of course, also check out Build that's coming up soon and coming up in a couple months. So come out and check us out at some of the live streams there. Also, I want to thank to our, again, just as Chibert said, thank our TD, Alex, for jumping in this week. Can you tell the folks at home what you're busy with over there at Twit? Oh, I'm busy filling in for Kevin all the time. <laughs> Kevin, he doesn't get anything done, does he? Uh, no, nah, he's, he's got more important things to do. <laughs> well, thank you, Alex. Thank you. Appreciate your time. And we hope to see you and or Kevin next week. Uh, and until next time, I'm Louis Moresca saying, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep twiet. <laughs> <laughs>